Next, from Elmhurst, Senate President John Cullerton gives an address at Elmhurst College's annual governmental forum on the FY 2017 budget and revenue. Later, Senator Cullerton takes questions on the impeachment trial of Rod Blagojevich, gun control, and how to fix Illinois' pension problems. This runs about 50 minutes. While anyone can steer a course when there are no obstacles, a true leader can forge a strategy that people will follow and not be swayed by discourse. I believe that President Cullerton is such a man, a man and capable of leading this state. And we are honored to have him as our keynote speaker of the 10th annual Elmhurst College Governmental Forum. Please join me in welcoming the Senate President of the State of Illinois, John J. Cullerton. I should also tell you that Lee Daniels, who we mentioned uh, I met when I first got into the General Assembly, but he gave me uh, really uh, an inspirational tour of Elmhurst College. And, you know, he kept on asking me to come, and I'm kind of busy, but I, I said, you know, I really ought to do this. And it was, it was fascinating. And that's why I, I really couldn't turn down this invitation because of uh, the fact that I'm so impressed with the, uh, with the college. And by the way, I also should tell you a story about Lee. When I first got elected Senate President, which was about eight and a half years ago, uh, each Senate President has uh, a portrait that hangs in the Senate. And either in the past there were actual paintings and more recently uh, photographs. And my goal was to get a photograph taken as soon as possible in my terms so that I would not age, you know, throughout the, this eight and a half year period. So I wanted to get an idea about where, you know, the, what would be the best place to have the picture taken and how to stand and all that. So I went over to the house to look at all the portraits of the uh, speakers. And I looked at all these speakers' portraits, and I noticed that Lee Daniels' portrait was not there, even though he had been the Speaker of the House. So I called him and said, where's your portrait? And he goes, well, I don't know. <laughs> Ask Madigan. <laughs> so I did. I called the Speaker and said, hey, where's, the, where's, where's Daniels' portrait? And he goes, I don't know. And I said, well, can we put the portrait up? And he goes, sure. Although a number of years had passed, and Lee's and my hair had changed colors, but we were able to do that, and his portrait hangs in the Illinois house right now. So, so let me get on with my, my speech here. This is a great invitation to speak, and, and, and this is kind of a, a bad news, bad news kind of speech. <laughs> so let's get right to the bad news. Um, <laughs> Illinois has a backlog of overdue bills, late payments, so to speak, that recently topped $13 billion. Now the $13 billion is real. The state has never been so far behind in paying people. That means businesses that do business with the state often end up waiting months and months to get paid for whatever service or product they provided. $13 billion, that's a lot of money. It's also really hard to grasp. I don't have $13 billion. Bruce Rauner doesn't have $13 billion. I don't even think J.B. Pritzker has $13 billion. So you know that's a lot of money. It's basically $1,000 for every man, woman, and child, documented or undocumented, living in Illinois right now. Don't worry, we're not passing around the collection plate, at least not today. What I would like to do, though, today is um, a little Illinois Budget 101. And there will not be a quiz uh, today, but there will be at Elmhurst College afterwards. Because in order to understand our problems, you have to understand how they accumulated. And then, hopefully, you can better understand what we can and can't do to clean up this mess. Because at the end of the day, you really can't run Illinois like a business. Democracy and CEOs don't mix too well. And I believe our governor is struggling with that right now. So, first thing I want to do is start with where Illinois, the state of Illinois, gets its money. So you have to understand, we are currently more than halfway through our fiscal year of 2017. The state's fiscal or budget year is July 1st through June 30th. So the next budget year, fiscal year 2018, starts July 1st, 
2017. Normally, we'd have a budget in place for fiscal year 2017 and be debating what we like and don't like about the government, the governor's 2018 budget plan, with the goal of having uh, with the goal of having something on his desk before our legislative session ends on May 31st. In the current budget year, Illinois will collect a little more than $31 billion to support state spending. And as you can see, the biggest chunk, the blue slice of that, comes from the state personal income tax. Our current state tax, income tax, is 3.75%. And this is a flat tax. Most states are not have, do not have flat tax. So that is, everybody pays the same rate. And I should point out, unlike most states, we don't tax retirement income, even though, as I said, most of the nation that has an income tax uh, does tax retirement income. And by the way, I'm not proposing that we change that. I just want to point it out that that's what we don't do. So that tax rate temporarily increased to 5%, from January 1st, 2011 through December 31st, 2014, and then it dropped down to this 3.75% at the start of 2015. As you see from the chart, the second biggest source of funding is the state sales tax. That's the green slice. The state sales tax rate is 6.25%, though, as you know, local governments can and do add on to that. Now, the sales tax in Illinois is applied to things or goods, not services. In other words, if you get a new muffler, you pay sales tax on the new muffler, but not on the service to install it. And that makes us unique as well. All of our neighboring states tax many more services. So combined, the state income tax and sales tax provides about 70% of the money for the state budget. Those other sources include the corporate income tax, which as you can see is only 5% of the total. Federal funding is in this chart because we get federal funding to match our Medicaid spending. And then the other uh, category are things like public utility taxes or gaming taxes. Of note, you do not see property taxes in this chart. That's because the state of Illinois does not have a property tax. State government doesn't collect or spend any property taxes. That's purely a local government function. We can, and in some cases, have put limits on those local taxes, but property taxes are a function and responsibility of school boards and city councils, not the General Assembly and the governor. Okay, now that we know where the money comes from, let's check out where it goes. Now, we are halfway through our current fiscal year of 2017. And this is by no means a normal budget year, which I'll explain in a bit. So let's start with the biggest piece of our spending goes to preschool and high school education. It's $7.4 billion. By the way, this is the only part of the budget that was actually appropriated and passed by the General Assembly and signed by the governor. The next largest expenditure is Medicaid at $7.2 billion. Medicaid is a state and, as I said before, a federally funded program that helps cover medical costs for people with limited resources. It pays for things like nursing home care for low-income seniors, personal services for disabled adults, and care and services for severe and profoundly disabled children. For perspective, nearly two-thirds of the nursing home population in Illinois relies on Medicaid funding. And by the way, to be clear, it's not Medicare. That's the federal health insurance program for people who are 65 and older. We are also spending $6.9 billion on pensions. Now this includes pensions, over half of it is for teachers, not including Chicago. That's kind of important in our current debate in Springfield as well as university employees and, and uh, community college employees and state workers. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of that money is catching up on decades of underfunding. And now we have the rest of state government. So two things I'd like to point out. First, all of the state salaries combined, and you see it on that slide, cost $3.2 billion. We have the second 
lowest ratio of state workers to population in the nation. This means you could fire every state employee and still not solve our budget problems. You would, however, create some major problems in the prisons and the no state police. Second, you see that another s slice of the pie is higher education. It's down at the bottom. It's only $700 million. That's the total that the state is providing for all of our public universities and community colleges combined. It's the smallest pie. Hundreds of millions have been cut from higher education in recent years. That means the schools are balancing their budget with higher tuitions and fees and because at the end of the day, it's all just a balancing act. So if you add up all of these slices, we're at $34 billion in spending. We have other slices on the pie like debt service and revenue sharing that we give to local governments and the RTA. So the total, as you can see, $34.4 billion. Now, some of you have already done the math and realized that there is a $3 billion gap. Lawmakers and the governor agreed to the education budget to keep the schools open. All the other spending is a result of legally required spending. You see, this is uh, not just a debate between lawmakers and the governor. There are three branches of government, and the judiciary plays a role, a key role. Right now, the judiciary has actually authorized more state spending than the governor. I told you this is not a normal budget. For example, over the years, the state has been sued over whether it's providing the appropriate level of funding and services to people with disabilities, children who are wards of the state, and so on. So to settle those cases, the state agreed to maintain certain levels of service, and that requires certain levels of spending. And the judge doesn't really care whether there's a budget or not. The judge wants to make sure disabled children's rights are protected. So in other words, there are court orders in place so that foster children aren't simply cut off because we politicians can't get our act together and produce a budget. So this autopilot spending has prevented a full-blown government shutdown, even as the state has gone nearly two years without a full budget. But it has also resulted in the state spending far more than it has, millions of dollars, all of which sends the backlog of overdue bills soaring. But I told you it was a bad news, bad news speech. Our budget problems don't end there. Hold on. It gets a lot worse. There's also this thing called reality that pressures our finances. So let's look at higher education. The budget for our state colleges and universities is usually around $1.8 billion a year. For this year, we approved and the governor okayed spending $700 million. The funding ran out actually on January 1st. The colleges and universities need roughly 1.1 billion more. That would include MAP funding, some of which goes to Elmhurst College. So without it, there will be no financial aid to middle class students, and at least one, if not more, of our four year state schools will end up closing. Schools are already cutting degrees and laying off staff. High school seniors are increasingly looking out of state for their diplomas, a troubling ten trend for our future. There's another piece of the pie there, group insurance. That's the health care costs for state workers and their families. The current budget contains zero dollars for that. Employees are paying their premiums. We are incurring the debts from doctors and hospitals. The state simply stopped contributing under this administration. So we know the cost, it's about $1.8 billion a year. We have a legal responsibility to pay for it, we just don't budget for it. So it gets dumped into the backlog. How about human services? These are vital services so far ha that haven't been covered by court orders. These are things like domestic violence shelters and cancer screenings for low-income wo women. This funding was eliminated last year even as the Rauner administration continues to sign contracts with service providers these groups and organizations have a signed contract but can't be paid because there's not a legal authority to pay them because we don't have a budget. And even if we did, there's not enough money. All this pushes the deficit and our current budget closer to really $7.3 billion. 
it eventually ends up in that stack of overdue bills, sending it soaring even higher. So remember, so far, we're only talking about the current budget year, the one we're in now. If you look at the budget the governor proposed for next year, it has another $7.5 billion deficit in it. Again, all of this piles up to that $13 billion backlog of bills. These are big numbers that are hard to comprehend. But there are real economic consequences to this growing debt. This is money we owe real people. So my friend who's not able to be here today, Kirk Dillard, uh, talked to him earlier, the former DuPage County State Senator, is now chairman of the RTA. The state owes that agency about $400 million. The agency borrows to cover the shortfall. Here's the catch. The state doesn't pay the RTA interest on the, that money that they're borrowing, but the RTA has to pay the interest on the borrowing to cover the state money. The agency ends up losing about $2 million a year because of this. That's enough to buy five new metro cars or rehab three train stations, which are far better uses of the dollars than paying interest on a loan. So if you use Metra and you think the train cars are too crowded or too old or your local train station is in run down and needs updating, the state's failure to pay its bills is to blame. Local schools have been hit too. The state owes Elmhurst School District 205, a total of $2.4 million for special education and student transportation. Glenbard Township High School, District 87, is owed $2.8 million. And DuPage Schools, 88, is owed $1.6 million. And they're not alone. The state owes Haymarket Center nearly $1.5 million for count this is counseling work and other services done on the state's behalf. The Lutheran Social Services is one of the state's largest human service provider. It offers foster care, child care programs, home care for seniors, assistance, and disabled adults, mental health counseling, and addiction treatment. That also means the not-for-profit organization is a major employer. So when the state failed to pay Lutheran Social Services millions of dollars for work it had done on the state's behalf, Lutheran Social Service had to cut 30 programs and lay off 750 workers. And just to clarify, when you lose your job at Lutheran Social Services, you go to the same unemployment line as anyone else who's lost a job. So as you can imagine, over the course of $13 billion, there's a lot of anxiety and stress on workers, their families, and our economy. It obviously doesn't help our business reputation. And if we don't do something soon, our backlog will be out of control and our financial standing so wrecked that our options for resolving it will be severely limited. There are those at the Capitol, not me, but those at the Capitol who view this all through an electoral or a political lens. They say, you know what, let's save this debate for the 2018 governor's race. Let's let the candidates kind of spell out their answers. Well, that'd be great, except there's a few consequences for that inaction. That $13 billion backlog of overdue bills will keep growing. By election day next year, 2018, it'll be $24 billion, and you can see what it continues to rise to. I'm not making this up, by the way. These are the governor's numbers. By election day, we'll probably have been downgraded to junk bond status. It'll be impossible to even borrow money and politically impossible to raise the taxes needed to fill this gap. So you might be asking yourself, how do we get into this situation? How did it get so bad? Well, here's my short answer. The state let a temporary tax increase expire at the end of 2014, in part because the newly elected governor, Bruce Frowner, campaigned on rolling it back. And upon winning, asked us not to extend it before he took office because he had a plan to balance the budget. Well, here we are, still waiting two years later on a real plan to manage the state's finances. Here's some perspective on where we were back in 2014 and where we are now. When the state's 2014 budget ended, the backlog of bills was $3.8 billion. And believe it or not, that's a manageable number. That's a 30 to 45 day turnaround between getting the bills and sending out the check to pay for it. A third of those bills had been on hand for less than 30 days. Only 8% were more than three months old. Fast forward to today, a majority of that $13 billion has been sitting there for at least three months. 
Some state health insurance bills are over 500 days old. The state already owes more than $370 million in late payment interest on these health care bills. That's three times what the state paid in late payment penalties tolling just two years ago. All right, so now we get to what we're doing about this mess. Normally, the governor invites four legislative leaders to meetings to negotiate a budget plan. Last year, the governor pulled the plug on those meetings. He claimed that um, we Democrats were not serious about balancing the budget. So I must, at this point, tell you how appreciative I am for uh, Republican leader Christine Bredonio and the work that she's done. Because after um, we had these, this breakdown in talks, um, I give her a lot of credit for starting these, this bipartisan process. After the last of those leaders' meetings, she said things were not going well, and she asked me if we'd like to work together to see if we could put together a budget deal ourselves. And that's what we call this grand bargain. That's how it was born. Our staff spent weeks working on the details. In January, we unveiled more than a dozen budget and reform proposals covering everything from the missing budget for the current year to reducing the number of local government units to raising revenue and changing our government pension and workers' comp systems to produce savings. That $13 billion backlog, we, there's a plan to refinance that debt, borrow the money from lenders rather than vendors, and pay down it to a manageable level, and get those dollars back in the economy to support jobs and services. The catch in all of this is that all the proposals are linked together. If one fails, they all fail. There's a specific amendment that says in order for Senate Bill 7 to become law, all the others have to become law, for example. It's a compromise in the truest form, something we don't see enough of in Springfield, obviously. It's an intricate and delicate give and take designed to create a plan that can win bipartisan support among lawmakers and hopefully get the governor's signature. It's not a Democratic plan. It's not a Republican plan. We've all influenced it and we all need votes from both sides of the aisle to pass it. As you may have heard, we had some initial success, but we hit a snag. On February 28th, we started voting. We approved about half of the deal, and those votes were bipartisan. In fact, there's 22 Republican senators in the Senate uh, out of 59, and nearly half of those Republican members voted for some sort of the deal on the first day. And then came day two. And when we plan to take up the taxes and the workers' comp reform and other vital components, and that morning it became clear to me that if we called the plans for a vote, that uh, Leader Redonia might be the only one voting for the, uh, the deal. The other Republican senators were off the deal. So is it dead? I hope not. I sure haven't stopped working on it. I have to be hopeful because the reality is that there's no plan B. The governor doesn't have a budget plan a balanced budget plan. He's relying on us. His budget book literally has a line in it. I'm not making this up. His budget book has a line in it. His balanced budget book has a line in it that says grand bargain savings. That's our bill. That's our package of bills. So without it, his plan doesn't balance. So a few weeks ago, I gave a, a speech regarding the Senate's effort and made this point. If not this plan, then what? And if not now, then when? And to date, no one has answered uh, that question. We have serious problems that need to be addressed. I could sit back and just criticize the governor, but that's not going to solve the problem. The proposal we put together in the Senate goes a long way towards solving our problems, further than anything else anyone else has offered. There are parts of it, believe me, that I don't like. But I'm not going to have to accept, I have to accept, that if there's ever going to be a compromise and a solution, I have to accept the whole package. And so I keep working on the grand bargain because doing nothing is not an answer. It's not why voters sent me to Springfield, and it's not why my colleagues elected me Senate President. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to answering your questions as best I can. Well, hopefully the next few minutes will be a little lighter. And, uh, but not completely. Uh, I planned some uh, softball questions and some really difficult questions. Um, and I think I can give you a little perspective into President Cullerton's character. And uh, one thing I may mention, 
that um, inland real estate has been around for almost 50 years and one of the very first pieces of litigation we ever had many many years ago in the 70s we were represented by John Cullerton and uh, you'd be pleased to know we went to litigation and he won the case for us yeah. and if I lost the case I wouldn't be here <laughs> <laughs> well so we've known each other a long time and we have a great deal of respect so to begin let's look at your life for a minute and realize that you were raised in DuPage County in fact in Wheaton one of the most Republican cities in the country yet you ended up as a Democratic office holder when and how did you make that decision to enter politics as a Democrat well my family had been in politics since 1873 my uh, great-grandfather's brother was a state representative and uh, at the time that I was growing up Parkey Cullerton was the Cook County Assessor so I didn't really think much about politics I really wanted to be a, a lawyer because my my grandfather was a lawyer <coughs> and but when I went to Chicago and to go to school there people got me saying are you related are you related and finally I figured out that I was uh, in the same family that had been in politics so uh, the first time I actually ran for office was in 1976 to run for the Democratic Convention. Uh, I met a bunch of elected officials and I said, I think I'd like to do this. And that's how I got this, decided to, to, to decide to run. And then I ran uh, in, in the north side of Chicago uh, for office the first time for state representative in 1978. And as a representative and as a senator, how many years have you been in public office? Well, I guess I'm in my 39th year. So, which compared to the speaker, I'm a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's take a little more difficult question. As president of the Senate, you oversaw the impeachment of a Democratic governor, Governor Blagojevich. That had to be a difficult time. He was a member of your own party. You'll probably never participate in an impeachment again. How did that affect you? Right. Well, the background is that um, Rod Blagojevich was a constituent who lived two blocks from me on the same block. And we did not have such a great experience. I had uh, run for Congress unsuccessfully uh, against Dan Rustenkowski. You may remember that name. And he was uh, supportive of Rustenkowski. So we weren't exactly that close, but I was his um, state senator. I was happy that we got a Democratic governor after so many years. But he was obviously a big disappointment. And uh, Chris Rodonio and I were nominated by our respective caucuses to be the leaders of our party and uh, we were looking forward to working on passing a capital bill and getting a balanced budget and the governor got arrested uh, in December and we hadn't even been sworn in yet so uh, the first job we had was to put together an impeachment trial uh, it, which obviously we had never had in Illinois and we did it in a bipartisan fashion because we were very concerned that we take it very seriously. We, didn't, we knew we were setting a precedent for uh, the future. And uh, we, we had a committee that was made up of equal number of Democrats and Republicans. Um, you may recall the governor literally didn't show up for his own trial. He went on national television, he really embarrassed the state. And it was um, only about, uh, you know, well, the first day I got elected was the first day we started the trial. And um, after, after three weeks, he was uh, unanimously um, convicted of the impeachment, and we moved on with a, a new governor. Do you think that's had any lasting effect on Illinois politics or on your position? You know, um, it was just a really disappointing time because we, again, went six years with no cooperation, intramural fighting. Uh, we let the deficit start to uh, build over that time. And, um, it, but I would say that within 10 weeks after we both finally impeached the governor, we passed a major bipartisan capital bill. This was 2009, folks. This was after Lehman Brothers. This was the height of the recession. The revenues for the state plummeted for a two-year period. And yet we put a bunch of people back to, together 
a bunch of people to work uh, by passing a capital bill. So we really rebounded, I think, politically uh, as a result of that unfortunate situation we worked together right from the start. Maybe we can look back to 2009 and rekindle some of that cooperative spirit. Yes, but not by an impeaching the governor. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another, another question. You have a district that elects you to the Senate and then the senators themselves elect you president. Your district is on the north side of Chicago and represents almost 200,000 people. There have to be times when the best interests of your constituents conflict with what's the, in the best interests of the state. And you have an obligation both as a senator and as a, as a president of the Senate to take positions. How do you reconcile differences that uh, conflict your constituents with your role as president of the Senate? Well, that's a good question, uh, fair question. The first thing, of course, is you have to get elected. And I feel that my political philosophy is pretty much aligned with uh, the, the majority of the people in my district. It's a uh, north side of Chicago district, along the lakefront, pretty well off, um, pretty progressive politics, but a lot of, a lot of wealth in the district. Um, and uh, I think people have been you know, pretty comfortable. I've represented that area for basically the whole 39 years. Uh, and I, I have had elections with contests and I've done pretty well. Now, when you get elected to your caucus, and Senator Verdonio and I have the same job and other Senate presidents that I meet throughout the nation, you are by definition at the center of your caucus. And the caucus, especially our caucus, and our members who are here can attest to this, is um, it's got a lot of diversity. So we have downstate, uh, Democrats. We have uh, Democrats who are from more conservative areas, but for certainly different views the, than my district. For example, our district in the north side of Chicago, very strong on gun control measures, not big NRA uh, fans, and yet we have members of our caucus who certainly are. So in, in, in being in a, in, a, in a leader of a caucus, you have to make sure everybody has an opportunity to um, uh, be treated fairly, and that's people what people ask for, and to be given a voice, and that's why we have we have long caucuses because we let everybody uh, vent their positions, and and I think people learn to respect everybody and learn to appreciate the differences that you have throughout the state. Well, let's take one example of a potential conflict, and that would be aid to education. The city of Chicago claims that they are underfunded by the state and downstate education districts claim that they're underfunded compared to Chicago. You have obligations both statewide and locally and the interests of Chicago are often at odds with the downstate interests. How do you deal with that? Well, education funding is a really relevant topic. By most standards, people would say that Illinois has the most unfair school funding formula in the nation in that uh, the areas that have a high concentration of poverty don't get their fair share. Chicago uh, fits in the middle of that, that category. There's certainly many more districts downstate, in very poor areas that are much worse off than Chicago. So, uh, and, and those areas are represented by, by Democrats. We also have Democrats who represent very affluent areas in the suburbs. And so it is an issue, it is a problem, when uh, we advance legislation because those regional issues uh, come into play. And it's not just a Democrat problem or Republican problem, the same thing happens in the other caucuses. So we have been working through that issue and I think actually as part of our grand bargain, we have Senate Bill 1 and we've reached, I think, a, we're very close to a compromise. It's an extremely complicated formula, but I think we've really come up with a, with a, with a compromise that will involve um, helping out Chicago uh, and at the same time not uh, threatening the existing school districts from having a big drop in revenue. Uh, and so I, I'm very optimistic about that. And, and the governor, by the way, has been very positive. It's one of the things I have no criticism of the governor's desire to in, improve on the school funding formula. It gives us something to build on. Yes. Let's go to something positive. Uh, with regard to your recent record. You made a proposal to address the pension funding problem. Obviously one of the biggest holes in the budget that we have is created 
by pensions that uh, have annual increases in the pension payments that are compounded. And it's become mathematically impossible for us to keep up with those. And you, you made a proposal that addressed some of those needs, yet your proposal didn't go very far. Why was that? Well, Dan, in order to answer the question, I first have to explain why we have such a bad problem, okay? So in Illinois, uh, unlike most states, <clears throat> the state is responsible for the employer portion of all of the school teachers in the state except for Chicago. That's 80% of the school teachers. The school district doesn't pay the employer contribution. The state does. Most states, the school district does. And on top of that, we're also responsible for paying for all of the university employees, the public university employees and the, the community colleges. We're the employer for that as well. And of course, we're the employer for the state employees. So we have, a, we have more people to pay for, if you will. And, and I point out that there's this anomaly that the state is not responsible, though, for paying the normal costs for the city of Chicago schools. So um, we have more people to be responsible for. And over time, we uh, have gotten behind in those payments. One of the problems is that the, one of the benefits is a compounded COLA that people get when they retire. I say a problem, it's, it's good if you're retired and you're getting a compound of cola, but it's very costly. And so uh, we've fallen behind, and as a result, uh, about 20 years ago, we passed a law saying we have to catch up. We have to get to 90% funding. And so we passed that law, and every year, we actuarially are determined have to put that money in there. And that's why that piece of that pie is so high. Now. About five years ago, we passed major reforms in our pension system so that all new hires do not have a generous pension at all. And that's been in place. And about 25% of all the state workers and teachers are at that lower level. And that's going to save billions of dollars over the years. But we still have the, the cost for the, for the active uh, and the retired teachers. So with all that background, I do have a bill that uh, uh, one other factor. We have a constitution in Illinois that has a pension clause that basically says once you get a pension, it can't be changed unless you do it contractually. So, uh, and that's where we passed a law that violated that constitution. The Supreme Court said you can't do it. So, we have come up with a bill that the governor supports as well um, that uh, does, I think, thread the needle. It's, it's a constitutional bill. It does save us money. It will save us, once it's implemented, about a billion dollars a year. Now, of course, the teachers and the state employees are not in favor of it. It's, it's something which will end up limiting their, their, their pensions. So that's why it's very difficult to pass. I tried to explain this to the governor. You know, once he, he and I decide, well, we're going to try to pass the bill, now you've got to get the votes. And I've had a lot of experience doing that. He's had very little experience. So it is part of our package. And if it was, I believe, if it's not part of the package, it, it, it doesn't have enough votes. I would point out that there are a number of, Senator Rodonio can speak to this as well, there are a number of downstate Republicans who have a lot of Republican union support. There's teachers down there are in the union, they're Republicans. The prison guards down there are, are, are where the prisons are, they're Republican. And they don't want to vote for it either. So it's, it's not just the Democrat versus Republican issue. But we're, it's in the package, and I'm hopefully that we can, hopeful that we can pass it. Just one aside, and that is uh, the merits of this bill um, look persuasive to me. I think you've threaded the needle pretty well. It seems like it should work. Um, how does Madigan feel about this? Has he opposed you? I haven't seen him support you very well, strongly. Well, the, the speaker, has, quite frankly, has had a, a history of being a leader in pension reform. He's the one that initiated the bill that limited the salaries or the pensions of those new which, hires. Which failed the Supreme Court. No, test. no, no. The, f the first bill we passed about five years ago. Oh, the one that... For the new yes. hires. He led the charge. That was Madigan's bill. Yes, sir. The bill to correct the pension fund for all future members yes, of the that's union. Correct. And he was also the one that passed 
what was called Senate Bill 1, the one that was eventually found unconstitutional, which had really much more draconian cuts in it than even the bill I'm proposing. So even though he hasn't weighed in on the bill that we're talking about in the grand bargain, uh, he's had, certainly has had a record of, uh, of, of supporting pension reform. And the reason, quite frankly, why we, you know, we haven't been negotiating with the speaker, because Senator Rodonio and I thought we'd try just to see if we could pass it out of the Senate first and then see what happens if we can do that and get it over to the House. Well, there are some pundits who allege that Madigan knew his bill would fail and therefore he supported it because he wasn't really in favor of butting heads with the unions and he put your bill into second place even though your bill seemed well, more constitutional. Actually, I think that the speaker definitely thought that his bill was constitutional and saved a lot of money and that was a good uh, thing to do in his mind for the long-term benefit. We in the Senate felt that it was real questionable as to whether or not it was going to be constitutional. But we uh, very reluctantly and very difficultly passed it, just barely, mainly to get a test case from the Supreme Court, which we did. And based on that test case, now I think we know how to draft one that is constitutional, and that's the bill that we hope to pass. So in the other alternative, which is changing the Constitution, amending the Constitution, how feasible is that? It doesn't work. So you can change the Constitution, but we still have a contracts clause in the Constitution. So I, I believe, and our lawyers believe, that um, going forward, prospectively, it would work. And we've already done that. We've already limited the pensions going forward, so that a, even a constitutional change would not uh, overcome this, this issue. But again, the bill that we have uh, in our package, which I hope to pass uh, with bipartisan support, uh, would be a bill that once implemented would save about a billion dollars a year to the state. All right, then a question that's a little, a little lighter, and that is Governor Rauner has announced that he's going to run for second term. If you were asked by me privately what you thought, <laughs> pretty, pretty hypocritical there. If you were to ask me privately, uh, and I were to ask you what you thought of Rauner's chances, or better yet, what advice would you give Go Governor Rauner to get elected a se for a second term? Well, the first thing I would do is I would ask him to delay the start of his campaign until after we've passed the budget. So, just, just, I mean, give me a couple months, a couple of months, just let's just focus on a budget and stop. He's literally, he's doing ads while we're trying to negotiate a budget. It's counterproductive. It doesn't help the members of my caucus, you know, who I'm asking to take these tough votes while he's doing ads slamming them. So let's just start with that. And then, you know, we do get elected to do stuff, you know? I mean, just for a few months, could you legislate? I mean, come on, this is, he's the governor, he's responsible for this budget. Uh, we're all trying to work together to make it easier for him to get to a balanced budget. And let's, let's see how the, the campaign plays out. We don't even know who, who's uh, for sure gonna be running. We don't know who, uh, who's gonna be his, uh, if he runs and wins. Uh, a primary if he had one. We don't even know who he's going to run against yet. So uh, I just think we should focus. Th that's one of the reasons why Senator Verdonio and I want to do this now. Can you imagine trying to pass this stuff next year in the yeah. middle of a... First of all, we'd be that much more in debt and it'd be impossible to take these tough votes. All right, that was a candid answer. Thank you. Um, one of the big concerns uh, most of your average citizens have with politics is that in the last decade or so it's appeared to get much more hostile, mean-spirited. Um, I've been a student of politics ever since college and um, that change in demeanor, change in attitude and change in behavior is very troubling. Do you agree that there's been such a change and if so, why? Well, there's certainly been a dramatic change. I mean, just in the way that um, the legislators, uh, um, when they go to Springfield, um, I had a roommate uh, who was Republican state senator for years. I haven't heard of people being that friendly, even you know, uh, uh, socially. Um, in part, I think it's just because of a dramatic change in how people get their news. 
And, you know, the, the, there was always negative campaigning, of course, but it's sort of been accelerating. And then, of course, the uh, influence of money has kind of um, dramatically increased, and there's, that has had a, a bad influence. So uh, uh, that's kind of the general answer, but um, I would say uh, the tools that we have as leaders to try to get people to come around, you know, are, are, are not as strong as they were in the past. Um, and so all those factors come together. It makes it more difficult. So what about the camaraderie following legislative sessions that you had years oh past? God, you'd all go for a drink downtown. Sure. And even the media, they used to have uh, skits and they'd make fun of us and we'd go to those things. Now it's, it's just, you know, the media, they don't have rep reporters anymore. They don't have state house reporters. Sometimes, for example, they don't have somebody in Springfield covering us. What they have instead are investigative reporters. So, you know, I showed you guys PowerPoints and stuff like this, and this isn't on the front page of the newspapers. You're going to see, uh, you know, whether Susanna Mendoza is being stalked by some one of Governor Rauner's persons taking a picture of her driving a used car and whether his car costs more. That's what people are covering instead of what's the state budget? What's the deficit? That's the kind of thing we should be focused on. All right, well, thank you. We have about three more questions, and uh, one question recognizing Lee Daniels, and that is, when Lee was Speaker of the House, they passed a bill that changed oversight of the Chicago public school systems from an elected board to the mayor in the name of reform. Currently, there's another movement to elect a new school board and not have the mayor be responsible for the Chicago Public Schools. How do you view that movement? Well, th there is, there's a, obviously the mayor's somewhat controversial in Chicago. He's had some ups and downs, and there are some people who have, are, are his political enemies. Uh, he had a, a tough uh, election for, re-election for mayor, and a lot of those folks are keeping that effort um, alive. And one of the things that they're doing is using this concept of an elected school board to help them in that, that political effort. So you gotta be aware, aware of that. The, the real problems though with the Chicago Public Schools is the, is the finances. And as I indicated before, there's this big anomaly in law where nobody knows where, how far it goes back about this pension cost. So we also acknowledge that there's a school funding formula which is unfair and in some cases actually benefits Chicago. So what we're really focusing on is trying to to uh, get this pension parity for Chicago, get a new formula that recognizes that everybody should kind of have the same rules throughout the whole state. Uh, I think if we, if we did that, uh, a lot of this pressure, this political pressure on an elected school board would, would kind of go away. As to whether or not it's a good idea, the way the bill was drafted has a lot of problems. Um, it would be the largest school board in, in the nation by far. Um, the, the, the elections, there'd be like 22 elections for the school board members. It might end up being just a, a kind of electing union members to the school board. And then there's unions who re represent the teachers. And the question would be, um, would there be any kind of, uh, of oversight? And, and what role would the, would the mayor have? So we are studying it. There's Senator Raul as a sponsor of the bill. Uh, it did, a version of it did pass the House last year. There's other versions of it. And perhaps we can reach a compromise on that too. And because we'll you imply that, that there'd be more accountability under a single person like the mayor, because if you don't like what the schools are doing, you can elect a different mayor. If you have 20 some school board members, you wouldn't even know how they voted. You yeah. couldn't keep track of their records. You wouldn't know who to retain, who to get rid of. That was the wisdom of Lee Daniels' legislation. I think I might have you come down and testify <laughs> on, on the bill. So, so I'll, I'll try to pin you down one more time. That's the first question that you gave a great answer to, but not to my question. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand? Where do you stand? Yeah. Where I do would... you stand on the nascent bill to yeah, have the, an elected school board the, in the, Chicago? The bill that passed the House, I would not be in favor of. And Kwame Raoul and I are working right now on amendments to the bill, and we suspect that there'll be a vote on that bill. But more importantly than that bill is having a fair, what we would view as a fair shake, shake of money 
coming from the state. So maybe those two would be combined and we can get an agreement. So I'm not ruling it out, but it's got some conditions. Okay, that's better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go. We have two more questions. Let's, let's go to a question that is uh, really controversial, and that is what can you as a state leader do to address gun violence in Chicago? Well, um, I used to um, work uh, at 26th in California when I first became a lawyer. I worked out of 26th Street. I then ran for a state representative. And I used to brag, by the way, when I was running for state representative that over a two-year period, I, had, I actually had the highest conviction rate of any lawyer out at 26th in California. Problem was, I was a public defender. So, but, but I was, but I was still, you know, I was putting people in jail. So, I viewed it as a conviction rate. So, and back then, back then, uh, in 1978, uh, there were 980 people getting killed in Chicago. Um, you would not, you have not seen any, any headlines about how the fatality rate in Chicago was half of what it was in 1978. Um, it's a tragedy because it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's such an isolated areas of the city. It, I think, I think there's like 9% or 7% of the, of the city's population is where 50% of the murders are taking place. Unbelievable cycle of poverty. And, and a breakdown in the gangs. The police superintendent told me that there's 1,500 people involved, that they know who they are. They're either going to be murdered or be the murderers. And yet, of course, there's people on the, on the innocent people are, 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 are shot, and it's just a tragedy. And, quite frankly, it was very disproportionate to the safety of the city of Chicago. So in my district last year, zero murders. And my district's all within the state of Illinois, uh, within the city. There, there's suburban, uh, you may have had a murder out here and you would have had a higher murder rate than in my district. Well, but is this a city of Chicago problem, a state problem, a federal problem, or all three? It's all three. And what we can do, one thing we can do, now, and the state legislature can't solve all these problems, but one thing that I'm in support of is that the, there's a, and I've, by the way, I met with your state's attorney out here, Bob Berliner. Uh, Berlin, the, the, uh, and he's in support of this legislation where we, we would give judges some uh, direction to sentence first time, uh, sentence drug, uh, I'm sorry, gun possession offenses more seriously. Uh, it's not a problem in DuPage. They're getting uh, high sentences, but in, in, in Cook County, there's some judges who have been giving folks the minimum when, for possession of guns. And this, this is a bill that's it's a compromise and um, difficult to pass. We hope to do so. That will keep those real bad guys behind behind bars um, longer. So that is obviously one thing we can do. And then the second thing, believe me, is that, the, that there's no jobs in these areas. There's no um, economic activity, and that's something that. Uh, collectively, the city and the state can. can so can it's work. not exclusively Chicago's problem. No, uh, there's much higher fatality rates in other cities throughout the nation. Chicago gets the, the reputation. St. Louis, Indianapolis, they have much higher fatality rates and, and, and uh, murder rates than we do.